and you just have that going straight up in front of you. You want to go to India? Move around it south. You want to go to China? Via Samarkand? Move around it north. Herat, key to India. You hold Herat, you can move around the mountains and go down to India, which is why to the British, no hostile power could possibly be allowed to hold Herat. This gives you an idea of the topography. Herat is right at the base of the Hindu Kush. Next. Now, I'm talking about this wind of 100 and southeastwards, 120 days. Do you have any idea what this is? Yes. There are traditional windmills, and since the wind only comes from one direction, there, the, the blades are just open to the wind from one side. These are the traditional windmills of Herat. This is where the windmill was actually invented. The Arabs discovered the use of the windmill in eastern Iran and the Afghan area and took the model and introduced it to their colonies in Europe, Sicily and Spain. And the windmill only appears by the side of the water mill in European civilization from the 12th century on. Now, this kind of photograph taken in 1970, just before 1978, it's not art, but it's anthropologically very interesting to see what the original windmill looked like constantly renewed every springtime. Now look at and see what it see what it looks like now. Next. Obliterated. Finished. Gone. Those pictures and those taken by my colleagues are the last pictures of the invention of the windmill. Next. So we're going to talk about the Soviet war. Let's say that, if you just look at the statistics, there were about 17 million people in Afghanistan in 1978. Five million of them were refugees in Iran and Pakistan by 1982. It was a relentless Soviet drive through the titanium-plated belly helicopter gunship to hover over a village, strafe, shoot, and make sure that nobody could survive in the village. So you would have a massacre from the air, and at night, survivors would decide, we have to leave. And you basically had an outflow of population, which peaked in about 1983 with more than one third of the Afghan population already living in refugee camps in Iran and Afghanistan. Mostly the Ring Road and everything between the Ring Road and the Iranian or the Pakistani frontier. We always moved at night until 1985. When we moved inside Afghan territory to bring medical supplies or just to bear witness to war crimes, we would move at night because of the helicopter gunship patrols in the daytime. In the daytime, we would hide under cliffs, we would hide in mud huts, or, as sometimes happened, if we were caught out in the open by Soviet helicopters or Soviet jets, we would then, if they spotted us, they'd call helicopters to try to look for us. We were traveling with Mujahideen. What we always wore in those days were not the beautiful striped chapan or silk coat. We always wore khaki-colored shawls. And we did exactly like our Afghan guides told us, which was squat, hold the shawl over your head, and don't move for two hours. And from the sky, you just look like a rock. Spent hours like that. Okay. All of this changed when anti-aircraft weapons were delivered to the Mujahideen by the British and by the Americans starting in 1986. 1986 was the peak year of the war. Gorbachev had just come to power. His generals were telling him, the Americans are going to deliver anti-aircraft weaponry. If we don't win in 1986, we're not going to be able to win this war. So 1986 was a nightmare year. The helicopter gunships were just slaughtering people from the sky. 
when you moved back and forth over the frontier, it was um, basically like Penn Station at rush hour, trying to get over the hills before dawn. If you didn't make it over the hills by dawn, anything that moved on those hills would be strafed. Nevertheless, the idea was a deportation. That is, you get rid of a population by pushing it so that it transports itself. You terrorize it, you strafe it, you shoot it, but you don't block the frontier. You're trying to push people out. To push people out and make sure that they don't come back or discourage them from coming back, what you do with the helicopters is scatter landmines, but little mines, not big things, not the kind of thing with which you stop a truck or a tank, but little mines that were made of plastic were no bigger than a human hand, and which had a wing and a charge. These mines were colored dark green in pasture grounds. They were colored khaki in desert areas, and they were colored white above the snow line. <coughs> Unless you were really watching for them, you could not see them. I remember once being on a television show uh, regarding human rights violations in the Afghan area in 1982, and I was talking about these mines, and I had a member of the French Communist Party actually challenge what I was saying, and I said, I'm talking about this mine, and it's been sitting right in front of you during this entire show, and you haven't seen it. What do you mean? Where is it? It was, of course, uh, what do you call it, De deactivated. I picked it right out of the potted plant. It was a green one. He hadn't seen it. It's there. Oh. Now, the thing about these mines was, if you stepped on one, it was just enough to blow off your foot, not kill you. That's even better than killing you. Because if you're running away from a Soviet helicopter attack, you will risk your life through a minefield. You'll lose a foot, perhaps. But you'll think twice about risking your way back into it. Also, blow off somebody's foot, that person is incapacitated, and it will take two other people to carry that person over the frontier to some clinic in Pakistan, which means you take three people out of commission. There are so many of these things in Afghanistan to this day that the poor country is regarded, along with ex I mean, sorry, with Cambodia, as the most heavily mined country in the world. Typical of what we were seeing in Peshawar hospitals was, remember, two 16-year-old boys, twins, they were lying next to each other on the hospital cots, and one of them was missing a right hand and a left foot, and the other one was missing a right foot and a left hand. Very strange. What happened to you? Soviet helicopter attack, strafing everybody. So both boys ran. As they ran across the field, one of them stepped on one of these mines. There went his foot. Fell forward, hung himself, off went his hand. His brother picked him up, carried him, stepped on a mine, off went his foot, falls forward, holds himself with his hand, off goes the hand. Other people put them on donkeys and managed to get them to Pakistan. I can assure you that one of the reasons why we put all our medical and veterinarian teams on horseback was better the horse than us. And in fact, the horses are so sure-footed that they would just feel their way, and the best thing to do in a heavily mined area is just drop the reins on the horse's neck, let the horse carry them. We all made it, but I have one friend during a nighttime crossing, um, one of these French journalists who said, you know, it was extraordinary. I was on my horse in the night, and the next thing I knew, I was sitting on my rear end. His horse had stepped on a mine and had been obliterated, but of course it had saved his life. Well, all of this magically changed in 1987. As soon as the Stingers and other heavy anti-aircraft weaponry reached various Mujahideen groups, Soviet helicopters no longer dared provide air cover over Soviet troops. The jets disappeared. It was as if day had turned into night. Soviet aircraft only began flying at night to avoid these, and by day, 
we were beginning to emerge and walk around or ride around. 